Moving on to our next set of notes in Unit 7 on cognition, this one being on the storage of memory. So we've talked about memory in general and encoding of memories. Now let's talk about how we store them and keep them over time. So storage is simply retaining the information and at the heart of memory is storage. There's three stores of memory shown below and this is just a reminder of the two three stage steps that we have. Sensory and working or short term memory and then long term memory. But we encode the information, right? And then retrieve it when we want to get it out. And this is the three box information processing model. And it shows the three stages of information processing with the stages of memory intertwined. Okay, so information processing being the encoding, storage, and retrieval, and the stages of memory being sensory, working or short term, and long term memory. So long-term memory is what we're going to talk about today because that's where we store items, right? So <clears throat> sensory, short-term, or working memory is what we talk about with encoding. Long-term memory is where we store the information. It has unlimited capacity. Estimates on capacity range from 1,000 billion to 1 million billion bits of information. Like, limitless. The story of Rajan recited, he recited the first 31,811 digits of pi, the ratio between the diameter and circumference of a circle, which begins 3.14. That's really all I ever remember and continues on indefinitely. He remembered over 31,000 digits of pi and got them correctly and that he was able to store that many pieces of information in his long-term memory. So how well have you encoded and then stored information? Which letters of the alphabet do not appear on a standard telephone keypad? And yes, I give you the answers here, but you can just ask yourself these questions. And do I know them? You probably didn't. Um, probably because it's not that important and Q and Z are not used that often. What is the color of the top stripe of the American flag? It would be red, bottom red again, how many? red versus white stripes, and then how many sides does a wooden pencil have if it's not circular? It would be six. Um, not remembering these things is more of an encoding failure because it's insignificant information. I guess you could argue that the Q and Z and the flag questions are storage ones um, simply because you probably knew those at one point. Um, how well have you encoded these questions? In what hand does the Statue of Liberty hold her torch? You know it's the right. Um, what, if anything, does she have on her feet? She is wearing sandals. I know that because I've seen the movie Ghostbusters when she walks around. <laughs> um, who is on the front of the $20 bill? That's kind of interesting, and I believe it's changing, right? What is on the back? It would be the White House. And then who's on the front of the $5 bill? And on the back, it's Lincoln and the Lincoln Memorial. Storing memories in the brain. Penfield, through electrical stimulation of the brain, concluded that all memories were etched in the brain and that he could stimulate memories. Um, Loftus and Loftus reviewed Penfield's data and showed that only a handful of brain stimulated patients reported flashbacks, so it's not as uh, useful information as Penfield believed. And then Lashley, in 1950, using rats, suggested that even after removing parts of the brain, the animals retained partial memory of the maze. So this all being research about how is memory physically stored? And that's what we're gonna talk about here with what we call a memory trace. And we ask ourselves, what is a memory physically, right? What physically is a memory? Can it exist? If I touch this part of my brain, am I touching a specific memory? Um, and the search for this and this is, the memory trace is called the engram. Engram is a memory trace. It's the, it is the biological basis, the physical existence of long-term memory. And there's two approaches. Looks on the level of synapses and biochemical changes that are believed to represent the physical memory trace in nerve cells. And that when the synapses are strengthened, it is believed that, that is the physical memory trace in the neurons. But then you're also looking at neural circuitry used by memory in the brain and that the circuitry are networks of many different neurons all working together is the trace or engram of a memory. So synaptic changes definitely happen. 
Long-term memory forming at the synapses as fragile chemical traces that gradually consolidate into more permanent synaptic changes over time. So we leave chemical like breadcrumbs in the synapses. The more we use, the stronger the memory trail. This explains why a blow to the head or an electric shock to the brain can cause loss of recent memories that have not yet consolidated. Okay, our synapses actually become stronger as we use them and we use like a breadcrumb, we leave like a breadcrumb trail so that we can better remember things. Neural circuitry, um, research began by looking at individuals who had parts of the brain removed in botched operations. Oopsie. So this person had surgery for epileptic seizures and his hippocampus and amygdala on both sides of the brain were removed. Wow, that's like a really big surgery. Since the surgery, this person has been unable to create new memories of the events in his life, although some memories for events prior to the operation remain normal. So he can't process new information because the removal of his hippocampus. But he does have memories elsewhere in his brain, showing us that the neural circuitry that we develop as we learn things stays with us in the neural networks in our brain. Brain structures involved in memory, this is really, really important. Um, first, the hippocampus, which encodes and transfers new explicit memories to long-term memory. That's huge. The cerebellum involves our memories involving any kind of movement. And then our temporal lobe, which isn't very visible here, it encodes and transfers new explicit memories to long-term memory. And our amygdala helps encode emotional aspects of memory. And our prefrontal cortex being at the very front of our frontal lobe, helping with memory involving the sequence of events, but not the events themselves. So the order of the events. All of these parts of the brain being very important. This showing you a little bit more. So the hippocampus aids in the initial encoding of the information. It's what helps us process new information. The cerebral cortex being up top, um, memories are changed into relatively permanent memories. And the amygdala strengthens memories that have strong emotional associations. And these emotional connections act as an aid for access and retrieval, which says that if we have an emotional tie to something we have learned, even if it's in class, we will remember it better. Very interesting. The amygdala is probably what is responsible for the persistent and troubling memories associated with PTSD because there's so much emotion with those memories. And so they're stronger memories, unfortunately, and come back even when we don't want them to. So where are memories stored is the ultimate question with, with the memory trace and the engram. Memories do not exist in one place. We can't agree with that but they reside all over the brain and it depends upon the nature of the material being learned. Information storage appears to be linked to the sites in the brain where the processing of that information occurs. So if it is visual information, the memory would be stored in the visual cortex. If it's auditory information, our temporal lobe and auditory cortex would be stimulated in both the processing of that memory and the retrieval of it. One impact on memory is stress hormones, heightened emotions, kind of going on that idea of emotional experiences enhancing memories. Stress related or otherwise, it makes for stronger memories. So stress seems to boost activity in the brain's memory forming areas. However, continued lengthy stress can disrupt memory. And this goes along with a concept we're gonna learn in unit eight called the yerk stopson theory in that if we're at a moderate level of stress, not too much, but also not too little, we will perform better. The same is true for memory.